Hello students. In this tutorial, we're going to be looking at three-dimensional vectors. When we looked at two-dimensional vectors, we drew the x-axis and the y-axis. And we sort of say that we could describe a vector in this plane using just these two axes. And we included to say here to describe a vector in two dimensions, all we needed was a component in the x-axis and a second component in the y-axis. But when it comes to three-dimensional vectors, now we're going to have a third axis, the z-axis. But because of that, three-dimensional vectors are very hard to picture on paper because a paper is a two-dimensional space. But now we need an extra component which is going to make the third the third axis, which is going to be in the third axis. Now, how do we do that? Well, lucky for us, in this tutorial, we're going to have a simulation to make it all easier. Here, for example, we're going to have the x-axis going along this, this line. So this is going to be the x-axis, positive in the direction of the arrow. And then we're going to have the y-axis going along this direction, positive in that direction as well. And lastly, the z-axis, positive, going upwards. One thing that you have to keep in mind when it comes to three-dimensional vectors is that they will have three components. One component in the x-axis, a in x, and the y component moving along the, the y axis or parallel to the y axis. And lastly, a third component, the z component moving along the z axis. So these three components are the ones that we use to describe vectors in three dimensions such that to describe the vector A, if this is our vector A, to describe it, we're now saying that you need to state it's, this is a vector of course, it's x component plus it's y component plus it's z component. Now of course, if we are trying to find the magnitude of the vector A, we will still be using the same methods that we did last time. In two dimensions, we had the square root of a in x squared plus a in y squared. In three dimensions, we just have to bring back to add that third component. So this is how we get the magnitude. This is how we get the magnitude of a three-dimensional vector. So the three components have been added there. But then how do we find these components? How do we find the x component a in x and how do we find the y component a in y and the z component a in z well we we'll need to find three angles the two methods in one method you need three angles in the other method only two angles are necessary so let's start with the first method to find the x component we need the angle between the x-axis. So we need the angle between the x-axis and the vector itself. So this angle, we'll call it alpha. To find the y component, we need the angle between the y-axis and the vector itself. Watch how this angle is. It's being measured from the y-axis to wherever the vector is. It's not horizontal. It's going wherever that vector is. So this is the angle that will be measured as beta, the angle between the y-axis and the vector itself. And lastly, to find the z component, which is the component along the z-axis, We now need the angle between 
the z-axis and the vector itself. So an angle measured from the z-axis up to where the vector is. So this angle will be taken as gamma. So now that you understand the three angles that we need, beta here, alpha here. So how do we then find the components using these angles? Well, we need to make triangles. Now, how do we make those triangles? They have to be right angle triangles so that we use the same methods that we remember, sine, cos, and tan. But then, how do we make our triangles? In 3D, you have to be a little bit more creative. Let me show you. To find the x component, you have to now draw a line starting from the tip of the x component going all the way up to the tip of the vector itself. Now, try to see it from the side how this vector is supposed to be. What you notice is that this vector is not vertical, but from the side, watch how the vector is supposed to go. So it's starting from where the x component is, going all the way up to where the original vector ends. Now, notice that the triangle formed by the x component and the line that you have just drawn, the one starting from where the x component ends to where the vector is, notice that the triangle formed is a right-angled triangle with the angle alpha between the x component and the vector. So with this in mind, we can then easily determine or create, write an expression that relates the vector itself, A, to the x component and the angle alpha now how do we do that well from here you can see that this component can this equation can be expressed in terms of cos so we're going to have cos alpha equal to the adjacent which is the x component ax over the vector itself a so this is the first relationship that we are seeing now the same thing can be uh, done when it comes to the other components Let's see exactly how it goes. Let's first create the triangles and then we see how it goes. For the y component, A in Y, with beta here, we see that again we have created a right angled triangle here. So we can express, we can write an expression that relates A to the y component and again it's cos. So we're going to have cos beta but now equal to a in y over over the original vector a so this becomes the expression for cos uh, for that will relate that will give us what a y is next we look for the expression that relates the z component so again for the z axis or for the z um yeah from the z axis we see that we've created a right angle triangle here with the angle between the z-axis and the vector as gamma. So we see that if we use cos again, cos gamma will now be equal to the z component, which is az, divided by the original vector a. So we have created our three expressions that we can use to get either the angles, if they're the ones we want, or the components, if we know uh, the angles, of course. In the second method of solving three-dimensional three vectors, we're seeing that to describe the direction of a vector, instead of being given three angles, alpha, beta, and gamma, we can be given just two angles and still be able to know exactly where the vector is or where the vector is pointing. Now, with this approach, we need two angles. In the diagram that I'm showing you here, the angles that are given are the one at the bottom called the transverse angle. It's an angle that lies within in the x, y plane. So it's an angle that is measured from the x axis to where the shadow of the original vector is. When I say shadow, I mean the projection of the original vector. So if this is my vector A, it's projection on the x, y plane. So we're taking the projection of this vector to be this line here. So it's more like the shadow of the original vector on the x-y plane. So this angle between um, the x-axis and the shadow here, this is the one that we're taking as this is the one that we're taking as 
theta, the transverse angle. Now, the second angle that you'll be given here will be the angle now between the z-axis and the vector itself. Now, this angle is measured strictly from or directly from the z-axis to where the vector is. And this angle is called the azimuth angle. And the symbol that we use here is phi. Now, we're saying in this method, we only need two angles to specify the direction of a vector. But then, how can we use this method to get the components with just two angles? Now, how does it work? To get the components using this method, what we're going to do is we're going to create two right-angled triangles, each one taking inside one of the given angles. Watch, for example, when we're trying to get the x component. The angle that is enclosed inside the right-angled triangle that we've formed is the transverse angle, and we labeled that as theta. The x-axis, or the x-component in red, if the vector is a, so this is ax, and the shadow down here, we're going to take the shadow as a prime, the shadow of the original vector, not, not a1, a prime, the shadow of the original vector a as a prime. And notice that green here, this line that completes our triangle, this line is parallel to the x axis, to the y axis. So this is practically just the x component, the y component of the vector of the vector a. Now, of course, since this is uh, theta itself, what we see is that if we used cos here, we are going to have cos theta to the x component over the hypotenuse. In this case, the hypotenuse is the image of the vector onto the xy plane, such that ax will come out as a prime, then cos theta. In the same way, we can write the same expression for, for ay. And in this case, ay will be related by sine. So I'm going to have sine theta equal to ay over a prime, such that we have ay equal to a prime sine sine theta. But a prime is not known. In most cases, what you'll be given is a itself, the original vector. But you're trying to determine the components. We don't know what a prime is. In each expression that we've determined for the x and the y component, a prime is needed. How do we find a prime? Well, this is where we go to the other triangle. The, the other triangle is going to close in the, the remaining angle which is the azimuth angle. Notice that again, we have formed a right angled triangle with this being 90 degrees here. The vertical here, this being the Z component of A, and the line on top here, you have to see that this line is parallel to the line that we described as the shadow of A onto the xy plane or the projection of a on the xy plane so if we label this as a prime this also has to be a prime and this vector here this one is the original vector a itself so if we wrote the expressions for a z and a prime here we'll see that if we used cos phi what we're going to get is the z component divided by the original vector so the z component, we have no problem with it here. It will come out as the vector itself, cos phi. But when it comes to a prime, for a prime here, it will be given by sine according to this setup, and it's going to end up being sine phi equal to a prime over the original vector, such that now we have an expression for a prime, and it will be equal to the original vector sine phi. So now we have an expression for the z component and take an expression for a prime. So with this in mind, we can now work out or get the full, full equations for the x component and the y component. With a prime found as a 
sin phi. It now implies we can write the expressions for a in x as a sin phi, then cos theta, and an expression for a y. a y was a prime sin theta, so it now becomes a sin phi, all this is just for a prime, and then the rest is sin theta. So we have sine theta here. So this, this two will give us ax and ay. And for az, remember, we found it as just a cos phi. So these now will be the expressions that we use to get the components if we're only given two angles. One a transverse angle and the other angle measured from the remaining axis to where the vector is. In this case, it was from the z-axis to where the vector was. So before we come to the end of the video, there are two more things that I just want to add here. The first one is the idea of unit vectors. Now, unit vectors are just used to represent the direction of a vector. For example, in the x-axis, the unit vector that is used there is i, and in the y-axis, we use a unit vector there, j, and in the z-axis, the unit vector that is used there to represent that is k. So these are just unit vectors. Now, what is the purpose of the unit vectors? They're just there to reemphasize the direction of, of, of a value. Let's say we wanted to represent the, the x component. If we just write the x component, in most cases what we end up with here is just the magnitude of the x component. But how do we present it while holding or while still specifying to say that this is in the x-axis. So to do that, if the magnitude of the x component is, say, 10, when writing it, we'll show the direction by just writing a subscript i there to say this 10 is in the i direction. So i here is more like just unit. That's why the name unit vectors. So there are three of them, each one for the respective axis. Now, if we are going to represent a vector, let's say, a, in Cartesian vector form. So if you have a vector A, to represent the vector A in Cartesian vector form, we are going to present it as a sum of its components. So we're going to have the X component plus the Y component plus the Z component. But to represent the direction, we're going to have those unit vectors I, J, and K. In some texts, you find that they will have caps just to reemphasize to say that these are unit vectors but i think most of my calculations i won't be having that but if you find them don't get uh, confused now this of course is just a representation form sometimes you find questions which will ask you to represent a vector in cartesian vector form then they want you to write it in this form but how do you find the magnitude of a vector given the components so we've seen so far how to find the components how do you find the magnitude of a vector given its components well to get the magnitude of our vector a all we have to do remember the square root of a in x squared plus a in y squared plus a in z squared what you see here is that you can't just add these vectors directly or these components directly. You have to go back to this method that we've been using, even for two-dimensional vectors. Now, with this in mind, there's one simple thing, uh, the last thing that I'll show you guys, that arises when you divide um, the original vector A by its magnitude. So if we divided the original vector A by the magnitude of A, notice that the difference between these two is that one is a vector, one is just... Um, a scalar quantity but the magnitude of a is the same as the magnitude of this the thing down here since it's the same thing so if we say this gives us what this will give us is a unit vector in the direction of a because this if let's say the, the vector here is 10 this the magnitude will also be 10 the difference is that this being a vector it will be pointing in some direction so if we divided this what you're going to get is one but that one will be pointing in the direction of the vector on top. So if we divided the vector A 
by the magnitude of that of that vector what we get is a unit vector in the direction of a but you remember what the vector a is so here let's say we have over the magnitude of a i'll just write it like this but what we end up with on top is the vector a itself and in vector in cartesian vector form we so to say this is presented can be written as a x in the i plus a y in the j plus a z in the k direction so if i multiply that one over a here we end up with a x over a in the i plus a y in the j over a as well plus a z over a in the k direction so this is an expression for the unit vector in the direction of a but we recall the expressions that we came up with uh, earlier where we saw that cos alpha is equal to a in x over a from here we can see that where there is a in x here we can plug in the expression for cos alpha we can put cos alpha here so we can put it there so we can put it there and we end up with u a equal to a not not a we end up with cos alpha in the a direction plus cos beta in the j direction plus cos gamma in the k direction so this will be an expression for the unit vector in the direction of our vector a since what we have here is an expression for the unit vector we can literally change this to a more general expression for the magnitudes the magnitude here let's say of our expression here the magnitude here this ua has a magnitude of one so we can write this as the square root of the squares of uh, the components here for example the first one this will end up being cos squared alpha plus the next one here will end up being cos squared beta and then next up this side we end up with cos squared gamma so we end up with this expression notice that this is similar to what we had here but the difference is since that was a unit vector in the direction of a we know to say this the magnitude of the vector on the left hand side was just one in that case not here so it's just one it's literally similar to how we moved from this expression to this expression so that's how we move from this expression to this expression but here we just want to keep in mind to say this is a unit vector in the direction of a so its magnitude is one here so i've got the x component squared plus the y component which is cos beta squared then the z component squared which is this so this expression reduces to just tell us that if we said cos squared alpha plus cos squared beta plus cos squared gamma this will be equal to one this would be a very important equation in our discussion uh, yeah in our discussion so please keep this in mind it will come in handy every now and then these are the things that you guys need in your understanding of uh, 3d vectors i hope you found this video helpful it took me a very long time to make so i hope you appreciate it if you do please consider leaving a like subscribe to the channel share the video with your friend to help them understand the vectors as well and if possible give me a super thanks i appreciate that a lot now guys we'll see you in the next tutorial where we'll be seeing examples on how to use these concepts to solve actual questions all right see you next time